room 15, I'm going to read you chapter 7 from The Secret of Nim, and it's called The Owl. After you're done listening to this, you're going to go to those Google Forms and fill out um, both chapter 7 and 8 on Google Form. Okay? Jeremy appeared as promised when the last thumbnail of sun winked out over the mountains beyond the meadow. Mrs. Frisbee was waiting, her heart pounding in her ears and three of her children were there to watch. Teresa and Martin standing beside their mother, and Cynthia, who was afraid of the crow, just a pair of round eyes peering out the round doorway. Timothy was down below taking a nap, and had not been told about the expedition, lest he worry and blame himself for the risk his mother must take. Indeed, the words moving day had not been mentioned in his presence. Even to the other children, Mrs. Frisbee had explained only a part of the problem. That is, she had not told them that they were only five days away. Uh, sorry, five days left nor anything about Mr. Fitzgibbons and the tractor. She did not want them to worry either. Jeremy landed with a swoosh, a bit dramatically perhaps, and nodded at the children and Mrs. Frisbee. Hello, he said. Here I am. Mrs. Frisbee introduced Martin and Teresa and Cynthia's eyes. Martin, who wished he were going on the trip himself, asked Jeremy in excitement, how, can you how high can you fly? Oh, I don't know exactly, Jeremy said. A couple of miles, I guess. Mother, did you hear? You'll be two miles up in the air. Martin, it won't be necessary to go so high on this trip. Jeremy said cheerfully, No, but I can if you'd like. No, thank you. I wouldn't think of taking you the trouble. She was trying hard to hide her terror, and Martin was, had not helped matters at all. But Jeremy suddenly saw that she was trembling and realized that she must be afraid. It's all right, he said kindly. There's nothing to be nervous about. I fly over the woods a dozen times a day. Yes, thought Mrs. Frizzy, but you are not riding on your back, and you can't fall off. All right, she said as bravely as she could. I'm ready. Teresa and Martin, take care of Timothy until I come back, and be sure you don't tell him where I've gone. With a small leap, she was on Jeremy's back, flying as flat as she could, lying as flat as she could, and holding tight to the glossy feathers between his wings, as a horseback rider grips the horse's mane before a jump. Martin and Teresa waved goodbye, but she did not see them, for she had her face pressed against the feathers and her eyes closed. Once again, she felt the surge of power as the crow's broad wings beat down against the air. This time it lasted longer, for they were going higher than before. Then the beating became gentler as they leveled off, and then, to her alarm, it stopped altogether. What was wrong? The crow must have felt her grow tense, for suddenly from ahead she heard his voice. An updraft, he said. We're soaring. There's usually one over the stretch of woods in the evening. A current of warm air, rising from the woods, was carrying them along. So smooth was the motion that they seemed to stand still, and Mrs. Frisbee ventured to open her eyes and lift her head just a trifle. She could not look straight down. That was Jeremy's back. But off to the right, and a bit behind them, she saw a gray-brown square the size of a postage stamp. She realized with a gasp that it was the garden patch, and Martin and Teresa, if they were still there, were too small to be seen. Look to the left, said Jeremy, who was watching her over his shoulders. So she did, and saw that and saw what looked like a wide, fearsome snake, blue-green in the color, coiling through the woods. What is it? she asked in wonder. You really don't know? It's the river. Oh, said Mrs. Frisbee, rather ashamed of her ignorance. She had heard of the river, of course, but had not known it looked like a snake. She had been there before. I'm sorry, she had never been there. Since, it, since to reach it, one had to cross the entire width of the forest. There was advantages to being a bird. In a minute more, they had left They had left the updraft, and Jeremy's wings resumed pumping. They went higher, and Mrs. Frisbee closed her eyes again. When she opened them, the garden patch had vanished far, far behind them, and Jeremy, searching the trees below, began a long, slanting descent. Even Eventually, as he banked sharply, Mrs. Frisbee saw off his wingtip a gray-brown patch among a stand of tall green pines. From so high, it looked like a gnarled gray bush, but as they circled lower... She could see that, in fact, it was an enormous tree, leafless, skeletal, and partly dead. One huge branch had recently broken off and fallen, and three pine trunks lay bent double under its weight. It was a gloomy and prim primeval spot, deeply shadowed in the gray dusk. Jeremy circled it over one more time, looking at a certain mark three-fourths of the way up the towering main trunk, just below this spot... Another great branch, itself as big as an ordinary tree, jutted out over the tops of the pines, and, at and, at and on this at least Jeremy fluttered, at last Jeremy fluttered gently to rest. There were some ten feet from the main trunk, and Mrs. Frisbee could see, just above the place where the branch joined the tree, a dark round hole as large as a lunch plate. We're here, Jeremy said in a low voice. That's where he lives. Should I get down? 
Instinctively, Mrs. Frisbee spoke in a whisper. Yes, we've got to walk closer, but quietly. He doesn't like loud noises. It's so high. She still clung to the crow's back. But the limb is broad. You'll be safe enough. And indeed, the limb was almost as wide as the sidewalk. Mrs. Frisbee gathered her courage, slithered down, and felt the solid wood under her feet. Still, she could not help thinking about how far it was to the ground below. There he is, said Jeremy, staring at the hole. It's just the right time. They inched their way along the limb, Mrs. Frisbee gripping the rough bark tightly, being careful not to stumble, and as they came closer, she could dimly perceive a small shape like a squat vase sitting back in the hollow of the tree. Near the top of the vase, wide apart, two yellow, round eyes glowed in the dark. He can't see us, Jeremy whispered. It's still too light. Perhaps not, but he could hear. For now a deep, round voice, a voice like an organ tone, echoed out of the hollow trunk. Who is standing outside my house? Jeremy answered. I'm sorry, who is standing outside my house? Jeremy answered. Sir, I am a crow. My name is Jeremy, and I have brought a friend. I hope we have not disturbed you. My friend needs your advice. I see. And can your friend not speak for himself? Sir, my friend is a lady, a lady mouse. A mouse? The sonorous voice sounded unbelieving. Why should a crow be a friend to a mouse? I was trapped, sir, and she set me free. She saved me from the cat. That is possible, said the owl, though unusual. I have heard of such a thing before. We all help one another against the cat. True, and now, sir, my friend herself is in trouble. I understand, said the owl, moving closer to the round entrance of the hollow. Mrs. Mouse, I cannot see you, for the glare of the daylight is too bright. But if you will step inside my house, I will listen to what you have to say. Mrs. Frisby hesitated. She knew something of the dietary habits of owls, and she did not much like the idea of being trapped in his house. Finally, she said timidly, Sir, I would not want to intrude, but I can hear you quite well from out here. Mrs. Mouse, please understand that I have no interest at all as a general rule in helping mice to solve their problems. I will, if you indeed saved a bird from a cat, I will spare you a few minutes, but I do not discuss problems with people I cannot see. Either come inside or tell your friend to take you home again. Behind her, Mrs. Frisby heard Jeremy whisper very softly, It's all right. He wouldn't harm you in his own home. She whispered back, I hope not. She walked up the limb of the hollow, climbed over the sill, and stepped inside. Up close, the owl looked very large. Each of his feathery feet were t was tipped with five gleaming talons, an inch long. His beak was curved and sharp and cruel. He blinked his yellow eyes and said, Please step across the room, away from the light. Mrs. Frisbee said, did as she was told. As she grew accustomed to the dimness, she looked around her. The chamber in wit into which she had stepped was spacious. At that level, almost half of the tree trunk was hollow and clean, but the floor was extremely rough. It was not really a floor at all, but only the jagged ends of the dead wood sticking up from below, like stalagmites in a cave, so that Mrs. Frisbee had to climb rather than walk as she crossed the room. In the back, the walls narrowed to a corner, and there she saw the owl had built himself a nest as big as a water bucket of twigs and leaves. From the top, she could see protruding wisps of the feathers from which he had lined it with. When she got near the nest, she stopped and faced the owl, who had turned from the light of the doorway and was peering at her with his great yellow eyes. Jeremy was nowhere to be seen. She could not only hope that he was still waiting outside on the limb. Now, said the owl, you may state your problem. Okay, that is the end of chapter 7. So watch the next video, which is chapter 8, and then fill out that Google form.